Anyway, I wanted to, uh, to jump into, uh, into some of the war models and, and just uh, have a couple questions for the panelists and then uh, try to open up maybe the second half of, of the panel to, to questions from you guys. So um, I want to start off maybe, Brian, with you, uh, Brian and Michael especially, since you guys have created your own uh, war models or, or something along those lines. Um, what approaches did you take to uh, creating your, your war models? Uh, Brian, first. Uh, I mean, I guess um, I guess the things that I that I had uh, created in the past, I never actually called them war models. I didn't I didn't express them as wins above replacement. I called them adjusted plus minus, but it's basically the adjusted plus minus models were basically goals above replacement models, um, which you could easily. Uh, convert to win to above replacement if you wanted to, um, but you know the, the things that you know we try to take into consideration, or you know it's what most people have done with their um, various uh, advanced statistics. Basically, you know taking into consideration how good the player's line mates are um, that he plays with most often, and uh, to a certain extent the the strength of uh, the opponents and. Um, and also the, the where they start their shifts, whether it's in the offensive zone most often, or maybe the neutral zone or the defensive zone, and uh, things like that. So, sort of, uh, you know, they were regression-based models, which uh, this class is going to be learning in week three, and uh, and about the regression-based based models, and they kind of take into account all five players that are on the ice for um, for the home team and the away team, and then what happens um, when those players are on the ice. Uh, yeah, I, I guess I don't have much to add in terms of um, sort of the basic approach. I, mean, I think the goal is really to try and isolate the impact of an individual player uh, and to try and get at that um, with a statistical model that accounts for a lot of the things that Brian talked about. Um, you know, I started what becomes the Thor model, which is sort of my model in this genre. Um, and like Brian's, it really was a goals above replacement to start. Um, you know, I start that uh, and do it with uh, events that the NHL records because that was that was data we had. It. You know, Brian comes out while well, that is in development, and I think Brian, one thing that his model does better than ours is he works at the shift level. Uh, whereas we work at the event level, uh, and I really think shift is probably the place to be in terms of what is the, the basic unit uh, of what's going on on the ice. Uh, Micah, you and I, uh, earlier today, we were talking about uh, war and talking about it as, as both uh, applications as a descriptive statistic and as a predictive statistic. Um, and I think this is maybe, I mean, it's one of the issues where, where controversy uh, is around more. Um, if I can phrase it this way, so, so if, if you're talking about a descriptive statistic, you'd be talking about how did a player do last season? So, you know, on a Stanley Cup winner, who, who contributed the most to, to that Stanley Cup winner? Then you can also look at uh, regression there was was a player particularly lucky. If you played that season over a thousand times, what's that? What was that player's true skill level for that season? And then you could take that a step further. How's he going to do next year? So you're taking into account aging. We're taking into account different circumstances uh, for him. So with that long preamble or intro, I mean, give your give me your thoughts on, on just these various uses of war in these ways. So I think uh, I think that breakdown of, uh, of ways to look at the, the kinds of things that you can measure once you have a model that you trust is good, um, and and it's useful in particular useful to, to focus on that middle piece of saying you know we can isolate what just precisely what happened you know it's easy enough to say well you know a goalie got hot and he won the Stanley Cup is massively reductive but maybe is the central point of what happened in a particular cup run the, and and if you want to revel in the history. Which is one of the things we do with statistics. Then, then you want to maximize those things. In fact, you want to highlight those things. In the sort of Sean McKindle style, look at this bizarre thing that happened. You know, isn't that cool? Like you, 
you know, there's, we talk about this like it's bad, but there's something, there's a, there's a strong storytelling aspect to that. Um, and you can, you know, doing statistics doesn't stop you from telling the stories that are interesting, it only stops you from telling the stories that aren't true. So you, in, in some glorified sense. So you, so there's that angle to start with, and I think that gets downplayed. The, we're legitimately more interested in the predictive modeling, especially those of us who want to find work, and uh, you know because that's going forward. That's where people have to make decisions about um, about the futures of people with millions of dollars. The and and those tensions I think are fundamental. And normally you're going to want to make a different sort of model for the one purpose is for the other purpose. And we share a lot of components. It's not surprising to me that the that the models that Brian has made and that the models that Michael has made and that the models that I have made all have the same elements and the same pieces and, and similar sorts of outputs, but, but they aren't all quite the same and they won't ever all be quite the same because they all come from slightly different motivations, slightly different data availabilities, and slightly different um, applications for what it is you actually want. Do you want to measure that descriptiveness about you know, what was it that happened you know, in 1976 in that particular year? You know, was that really my imagination, or did it play out the way I thought it did? Or if you want to say something like, what should the senators do next year? Now, those are uh, war models are useful for both of those things, but but in some sense they're probably going to be different war models with different designs and different um, applications. Brian, I got one for you, just mainly you, in that uh, you have had a prominent role uh, for a team in hockey operations. Um, what can you say from your experience about uses of war models or other models uh, for hockey operations, maybe both from your experience and what you ideally think that a team should be doing with them? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the big uses, um, you know, for sure at no point, uh, at least at this stage of uh, the advancement of hockey analytics, do you want to use these things only to make decisions? Um, and just like you wouldn't want to only use um, watching games to make decisions. So you don't want to use just one or just the other. You want to use some sort of combination of the two. And I think one of the big uses for like a war type model is to pick out the players uh, that you want to discuss more or go see more. So. Um, you know, if uh, if the, the folks who are either coaches or management or scouts are watching games and have a certain idea of a player, um, and uh, the south the stats say something about a player, I think most of the time those two things are going to going to agree. Most of the time, if you have if you have good good hockey people, good smart hockey people, um, and good smart analysts, um, you're going to have a lot of agreement between the two. Um, but I think like one of the one of the uses, one of the valuable um, ways that a war model can be used is to um, just to highlight those players where there are big differences between what um, the management coaches or scouts think and then what the data says. And that doesn't mean one or the other is actually correct. It could be that the model is not very good, or there could be some problem with the data that's making um, uh, you know that's that's skewing the advanced stats for a particular player. Or it could be that the, the scouts uh, might want to look at that player a little bit differently or um, just uh, learn to sort of focus on different aspects of their game and not focus on the things they don't like about their game, things like that. So I think it's really good for starting discussions about players. Um, you know, I think um, going forward, um, you know, maybe when there's tracking data and maybe when we have like robots making decisions in the future, maybe at some point you can use war type models to make all the decisions automatically for you. Um, who knows what, uh, what things will be like in 20 or 30 years. Uh, even the analysts might be out of jobs because robots are doing all the data analysis. But, um, but I think, you know, uh, right now it's, it's, you know, it's, both things can work together, and uh, and that's that's sort of how I see uh, war models being used. Great, thanks, Brian. Uh, two more, and then I, I want to open it up to uh, to you folks out there for for your questions. Uh, Michael, I want to add, just focusing back on this recent flare up of controversy, and there's controversy around war models every few years. Um, 
where do you see that, that controversy coming from? Um, and will there ever be a point where, where there aren't any controversies over war models? They're, they're much more accepted in other sports. So, uh, Michael, uh, primarily you, and if, if uh, Micah and Brian, if you want to chime in, uh, you can do that as well. Uh, sure. So, I think first I would say uh, the war models are still even somewhat controversial in baseball. Uh, there are still arguments about what exactly they should be and what exactly should be the components of that. Um, I don't know exactly um, where it comes from. You know, you're referencing this series of articles that the, the Athletic did. Uh, I don't know what was uh, what prompted that. I didn't see it on on Twitter, and so um, I guess I don't know where it's coming from. But I, you know, I do think we are still um, we are in a much better place in terms of uh, the idea that these models are used and accepted than we were four or five years ago. Uh, but I still think that there there are pockets of folks. Um, who don't like them. Um, you know, I think we are really being very reductive down to sort of a single number uh, in many cases. And I think uh, one of the things I think we don't do very well, and maybe we can touch on it later, is we don't really add some sort of variability to those. I don't, uh, you know, even the folks I think like Brian and I who have them there, we don't put them out there. Uh, and we could probably do a better job of that. Um, so I, I agree with all of them. Um, I think the, there's, there's speaking about, about conflict specifically, about the, the arguments that go around, I think there's two things to understand. One is, is that some part of the argumentation comes from a, a genuine confrontation between people who have been making decisions in a particular way, in some very broad sense, and from a different set of people who want to make decisions in a different way. And, and if you have people who are making decisions and other people who want to make decisions, that's a power struggle. It doesn't matter how you slice it. There's, there's going to be fundamental opposition there. And if it's not, I want your job and I'm going to take it, it's just, I don't like your ideas and I'm going to talk about how bad they are. And which there's no appreciable difference in how those things play out in all of human history. And there's, there's heat and light and sound all along those lines. The other aspect of it is that, that when you're, you know, it's very easy to say, you know, oh, we're, we're just doing the same things again, you see the same fighting, like, look, we were fighting about this two years ago, we were fighting about it a year ago, we're fighting about it now, and the, the cast of characters fight, and people occasionally change sides confusingly. And, but, the, the, but that neglects to realize that, the, that even if the fights are the same fights, the, the battle fronts, if you like, are just constantly moving. And ground, like, no one spends any time to say, oh, remember how our models used to be really bad? A lot better than that now. You know, that as soon as you gain any ground, you just immediately consolidate it and go fight the next wave at the next at the next place. There's no and so that means that if you're looking from the outside, and even if you're if you're on the inside of, of doing of doing work, you your experience is just constant fighting, even though there's actually a great deal of progress. Or even if there's not progress. And the point is that the, the appearance of the fighting has nothing to do with how much progress there is or is not, technically or socially in terms of adoption of models or if the models are Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like right. these kinds of discussions also happen on the business side of an organization. Uh, basically, anywhere where data is starting to be used in any organization or business, I'm sure they're all having these kinds of discussions. You have, uh, you know, the people who have the subject matter expertise, they have the experience, uh, and they have a really good understanding of the problem. You have um, other people who are like the analysts and getting into the numbers. Uh, a lot of times they're going to agree, like on the business side, uh, we were all in agreement that the best game for the year for us was Montreal between Christmas and New Year's. Uh, by far the best selling game, highest attendance, highest revenue every year. So it's not, it's not hard to convince people that the results of the model are correct when it, uh, when it agrees with them. But you know, then when, the, when the two are in disagreement, that's where the, uh, that's where the arguments or the uh, discussions, uh, discussions occur. Okay, Brian, one last one for you uh, before we uh, kick it out to the audience. Um, I know you've got your, your, your class there, um, maybe for their, for their interest uh, especially. Um, could you talk about how non-sports fields could learn from war-type models, and uh, can you think of any examples of uh, where they're used or they could be used? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think uh, anytime you're trying to isolate the contributions of someone or something 
um, doing some sort of war type model or like regression type model would be uh, something that'd be useful. Um, I guess like one example that I could think of, it, I guess I started thinking about this when I was at an HR analytics conference, human resources analytics conference, and I started thinking about it and actually, you know, player analytics, this is a, this is a human resources problem. The players are employees and um, you're trying to determine who the best employees are to hire to do a particular job. And so, um, you know, I started thinking about this, oh, this is all just like an HR problem actually. And um, then I started thinking, you know, you could kind of do this with sales reps. You could have um, revenue above replacement level uh, player for sales reps where, um, and, and we didn't actually do this, but it was just kind of an idea that I had, and I'm sure that there are organizations that do this somewhere. But, um, you know, where you're, where you're rating a sales rep uh, and you're making adjustments for how good are their sales leads that they have, or, or how good are the leads that they were given. So, and, uh, and how much better are they than someone else that could be hired at, you know, as like an entry level sales rep type thing. And so, you know, the more experienced sales reps are probably better, so they're probably going to be above replacement level um, uh, sales reps, but it's kind of like, uh, I don't know, it's kind, of the, I, it's kind of the first thing that sort of came to mind when I was thinking, you know, how are these things, how could these things be applied outside, outside of sports? Basically anywhere where you want to measure performance of an employee and you have some actual way of doing that, um, it could be applied. So. Sales reps, there's you know you can do it with revenue. I mean, uh, another employee, it might be might be more difficult because there might be might not be a tangible outcome. Um, that's that's kind of obvious, like revenue for a sales rep. Um, like I don't know how I would uh, rate Michael Shucker's teaching, for example, above replacement level. Uh, I'm sure it's positive, but I wouldn't know what replacement level is, and I wouldn't know um, what his actual level of professoring is. Maybe not significant. <laughs> if, uh, if you don't want your job, I will take it. <laughs> okay, uh, three very smart guys here. Uh, see what kind of questions you guys have on war or on modeling. Oh, hold on. I, I would just kind of add um, to build off what Brian said real quick. Um, is I have heard anecdotally that Google actually does what Brian is talking about. Uh, which is they look at people and groups and they look at the performance of those groups and they look at that over time to help evaluate <coughs> employees. Cool, okay. Do you want to? Back over how, do they, uh, how do they rate the employees? Do they give them like subjective numbers from one to five or something? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, who, who has more? You want to explain that, Brian? Um, the one, the one well, I actually, I actually wasn't making a joke, but I read what you're talking about now. Um, but I was just curious, how does Google do that? Is it subjective ratings, or I don't know, because this is secondhand information, um, so I don't know exactly that. Yeah, so I, I, I thought Brian was referring to. Uh, a comment that was made at MIT Sloan, uh, what is that, seven years ago, Brian? Uh, where a team was talking about their high-level analytics and how what they had is they had the, the GM and the coaches rate players one to five after a game. Uh, wow. they they <laughs> That's block hey, crowd question. Um, thanks very much for doing the panel. It was uh, great to have access to uh, guys with backgrounds like yours. Um, and I really love the uh, sales rep above replacement, revenue above replacement concept. I think there could be some runway there for businesses. But um, Michael, I had a question for you. You mentioned uh, the shift level versus event level trade-off in your model, and I'd just be curious to hear you elaborate on the benefits and, and depth. Sorry, sure. Um, so for, for Brian's benefit, um, the, there was a lot of praise above uh, sales rep above replacement. Um, and then um, the discussion about the shift level versus the event level. Um, so there's this idea in statistics that the level at which you're going to make a measurement um, is the, the, the biggest level at which you can capture actually all of the things, uh, all of the factors that have an impact. 
And so if you have an event, what you are getting in a statistical sense is you are getting actually some repeated measures by doing events. Uh, whereas if you do shifts, then, then you then have to summarize that shift. Um, there, you're really getting um, what I think would be the base unit for statistical measurement there without the repeated measure. So the, the event models have a little bit of extra repeated measures noise in them, a little bit of extra correlation there uh, in that. Thanks uh, for to the panel, guys. It's really good. Um, that uh, concept of is, is actually done a lot in manufacturing, especially when you're making things where there's line extensions. So you're attempting to determine, you know, this new fl flavor of Oreos, how much is it just going to cannibalize from the Oreo sales as opposed to actually extending the product, right? So that, that kind of model does exist already in, in some of the manufacturing, at least. Um, in terms of, the, you, I think uh, Brian made the comment early on about how the model is a place to start a conversation. And I was just wondering your guys' feeling on how much of the controversy is what we try to use it to end the conversation. You know, this objectively is the best whatever, or that kind of thing. So I, I, um, I agree with, with Brian's point familiar that, that one of the best uses of war models is to start those conversations, and especially to guide them in ways that are useful. Like you already have a disagreement between some model and between some particular person's opinion about a player, say, and, you know, but if, if your analysts are good and the people making the observations are also good, you know, you, you shouldn't take too long before you get into the well why. And, and you know, you could say, well, you know, this is the component of the war model that's dragging him down. Oh, I think he's good at this. Well, I specifically think he's bad at that because of this measurement. You know, you can, you can, you can take the arguments and distill them into their real essences quick if, if the models are good and the analysts are good. Um, but I think the, there's also a value um, in, the, in, the kind of, in the sense where if, you, if you're really making smart decisions as an organization, you don't spend any time thinking about, about ideas which are truly terrible. The, you try to only cycle the arguments around the things which are you know, somewhat viable options on their face. The, and if you have a war model that's decent, you can just cut off at the legs the starts of discussions which are, which are disastrous. You know, if you're, you have some war model and you don't even know how good it is, but you know it's kind of okay, and someone says, I want to trade this player with a war of 10 and a half, and this player with a war of minus 5, and you think, okay, which, no, it's not, we're not even going to talk about that. And, and now all of a sudden your organization is spending their time talking about things that aren't disastrous on their face. And so, you know, you, you don't, don't have to do that more than once every three years for it to be for it to be a good idea. You can just take some really, so you can take some conversations that you actually want to stop completely and stop them. I, I would add, you know, I, I don't think um, that I would ever look at just one war. Um, you know, uh, there are different, the, the, the four we've applied to different responses. Um, that is different outcomes, whether those are Corsi outcomes or those are expected goal outcomes. Um, and those are also helpful. So, you know, I, I, I think you end up maybe not ending conversations, but I think it's also important to say, well, let's look at a couple of different sort of analytic perspectives and add those. Uh, so, I have a question about terminology. So, it's, we're talking about goals about the replacing the wins. But the standings in hockey are by points. So should we be looking for points above replacement after all, and not wins? Um, so Brian, I don't know if you caught that, but the, the question was looking for uh, standing points uh, versus replacement versus wins or goals. Um, I think historically, uh, obviously, we know that two points is a win, uh, or a win is two points maybe more accurate to say, so that we could convert a win to, into points. Um, there's also, a, it's a fairly crude approximation, but six goals is about the equivalent of a, a, a win, I believe. Um, hello. Um, first of all, I just thank you for mentioning um, descriptive war versus predictive war at any point. I feel like a lot of arguments can be avoided by modelers explicitly stating what their models meant to be applied for. Um, my question is mostly about the difference between offensive war and defensive war. Um, uh, I feel like offensive 
um, the game, like offensive hockey, uh, the player with the puck has a lot of measure of control, and you can count uh, things they do, shots, goals, zone entries, what have you. It's a philosophical problem. Um, but I do think that one of the nice things about war models, as, as we say, is that they're almost always several models sort of put together in a trench coat. The, where, where we try to isolate individual abilities. You know, so it's routine to try to separate out, say, shooting talent from some other kind of talent. And of course, if you have, if you have a comprehensive war model, it's going to have something for goalies, which is not going to look at all like what you do for skaters. So there's already some purview for saying, OK, this is how we're going to break this into pieces, and then we're going to add up the pieces suitably to get our overall war measure. And sometimes a lot of the artistry is in the addition of the pieces and the way not in the, not in the pieces themselves. And so your question is a lot more like, uh, how do you model each piece? And so, for instance, despite you know, it's like easy to say, well, offense is the opposite of defense, but you might you might choose to model it in a way which was quite quite different. Uh, and then once you had those sub pieces, you could add them together, uh, however you like. So I and I would. I I, I would add. I, I think. Um, that the, the offensive and defensive part is actually something that is accounted for. Because we do have a sense um, for, you know, what are the percentages, uh, what are the percentage of shots, right, when Carlson is on the ice versus when Carlton is off, but also when Carlton is in the offensive zone versus what happens against his team. And then we are really comparing that against some sort of average for the league. And so we can get a sort of sense of that difference uh, in terms of those things not happening, right? They, they would be lower shot counts because the shot counts weren't happening. You want to add something, Brian? Uh, that, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> if so, we have uh, questions from students here, can we, uh, can we ask questions from here? After this one. Okay. After this one. <laughs> um, just a quick question as it relates to the complexity of these models. I find that sometimes what turns people off from a war model is that they might not understand why it has one player ranked above another. So if it sees one player that in their opinion isn't a very good player over some player that in their opinion is a good player, they're not able to point to a specific part of the model because there's so many regressions and there's so much complexity, so many inputs that goes into it. How do you think we as an analytics community can help explain these models in a way that makes sense to people? Because I feel like the complexity and the, the level of sophistication that goes into them, in a way it's good because that's improving our analysis, but it might be alienating the fan base at large. So uh, I really think that if we had some good data visualizations, then we could probably answer some of those questions. <laughs> <No>. um, <laughs> I, 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 I do think that the complexity is a part of the, the, the problem there. It is really hard because we're dealing, in many cases, with you know something that is 25 dimensional, uh, and how are those things playing out is is a complex thing. And the, I think, however, that we need that complexity to really try and model things. Um, at the same time, I think we could probably provide some summaries. I, you know, I think Micah's visualizations help a lot, you know, in terms of the explaining um, of some of those things. Um, and so I think those are helpful for moving us forward in the discussion. And I'll let him speak for himself. The, there's, so there's no question that, that specific techniques like, you know, visualizations over tables or, um, or a sophisticated scheme for measuring variance and error bars as well as just having estimates of abilities you know, aging, like taking into account all of those complexities. You know, that's that's definitely good, but the but there's also part of the tension is because some people are interested in the intricacies and some people are interested in the simplicities. And and the fundamental appeal of war is that it's extremely simple. Right? That's that's what makes catch all stats good is that they catch all the stuff. And the what and so on the one hand the you, it's not just that you need to be able to communicate well, or you need to be able to communicate clearly, or that you need to have a great grasp of subtlety. It's that you need to realize, as a communicator, that, that the audiences are varied. That there isn't a single audience for an evaluative stat, or for its components, or for its results. And, and so I think for that, 
Uh, on the one hand, as an individual speaker, you need to tailor what you're saying to the people you're saying it to to make sure that you're getting your point across. But also, in a kind of sociological sense, if you're thinking, you know, what are we doing as a community, you have to realize then that there's always going to be a certain amount of unavoidable friction. Because there's going to be simplicities that are too simple for some people and complexities that are too complex for other people. And you just have to say, well, you know, like you have to do a bit of, you know, sir, this is, you know, you want the other part of the store, kind of. Um, and, and that's a bit, the, you know, I don't want to call them soft skills because they're considerably harder than the hard skills. But, but that, that angle is something that, that hasn't been, it's not that we don't do it well, we don't, but we, we haven't even considered it really. There's, part of it is that, is that when you're down in the weeds trying to, trying to make something technical as best as you can, it's very easy just to, to get lost in how it's hard to do. And then the communication is, is another layer on top of that. And in some sense, if we, were, if we were a really sophisticated field, we would have the depth of personnel that would let you do that, where you'd have people who were skilled, you know, just like universities have um, communication departments that, that get results out to the wider world, have journalists have tech desks, which help them take tech results in. Like you, you have that whole infrastructure of people and not just, hey, I made a thing, look at my thing. All right, Brian, you have some questions in there? Uh, I think we might have a question from the class. Do you have a question? You want to come up and ask? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay. One second. Go ahead. So can we use uh, experience or like um, your gut feeling as like an independent variable in some model where you're trying to predict some sort of outcome? Or some numerical um, representation of what your experience and your gut feeling tells you? Can that be used in an independent, as an independent uh, variable in some sort of regression model or some sort of other model that you're, where you're trying to predict something? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> further. Right. So um, I think there have been a, a, a couple of attempts at that, but I certainly think um, you know my my mind immediately jumps to sort of a Bayesian framework, uh, which would allow that. Um, but doing what you say, which is um, adding a uh, basically a, a column or a variable as an input in terms of sort of, you know, the scouting department's view of those players, I think would be something that would be possible. Um, you know, Timo just mentioned, you know, the draft paper that I did where we took and we used the central scouting rankings uh, as an input, uh, which would be something like that. So one of the, um, one of the angles on this, on the one hand, I mean, the, the short answer is obviously yes, just like Michael said. But the, one of the longer answers as part of that is that the, it depends a lot. If you're adding, if you're adding subjective data into, into a model that you're trying to fit, then how well that's going to work for you depends a lot on what the deficiencies are of the model that you're starting with. The, I mean, in very broad terms, if your model is, is um, underfit, if it's too simple, if you're not picking up important things, then there's every chance that adding such a term is going to give you a big boost because probably the, the people who are making those value judgments are picking up on that thing if you're, if, as I assume, you're taking judgments from people who know what they're talking about. But on the other hand, if your model is already overfit, and you already have uh, exposure to everything serious that you want to talk about, then adding it in again in some extra combined way is possible you could get some sort of ensembling effect that might be good for you, but it's just as possible that you might just get hideous collinearity that you might badly replicate. You know, I mean, the, the problems of doing that are obvious, where you, you, know, you might get subjective bias, all the rest of it, non-repeatable measurements, because it's for all those reasons. The, but but you, know, you should have a sense with every model if it's, if it's been overfit or if it's been underfit. And even if you've done your best job, you still you always have your intuitions about which side of that fence you're probably falling on. The, and, you know, I've definitely left, mom, left models underfit only because I, I didn't know a way to capture the things that I, was, that I knew I was leaving out. And so that's where you would want to do that, you would want to have that made explicit before you, before you put that into a model. Yeah, I would also 
say like you know a lot of a lot of people will, will talk about scouting and stats as like these are two different things, but you can you can look at it all as information. The the, the analysts they're providing information just like the scouts are providing information. You can also think about it as everyone's providing data. The scouts, I mean, we talk about we're the data analysts. We collect data and analyze it and and air quotes look yeah. kind of fun that projector and very big, but. Um, but uh, the scouts actually, what they're doing is they're they're translating their uh, subjective opinion into a number, and that number is data, which can be analyzed. So um, these things can be joined in a you know, these things can definitely be joined in, in one model as all data, or they can also be sort of thought of uh, thought of as that these things are all information. Okay, I think that's uh, that's good for the panel. Hey, I forgot to say at the beginning. Um, at the NHL, we are actually um, hiring more people to, to uh, my group. Uh, there's flyers up front for a stats analyst position, if anybody's interested in that. Uh, thank you, guys. Good panel.